Thank you. Uh, it's always a little bit nerve-wracking when you're the first speaker at an event like this. So I uh, just want to apologize in advance if I'm a little shaky. Um, but I'd like to start off a little bit differently than most people, and I'd like you to engage in a visual exercise. So if you guys could please just close your eyes. If you don't want to, you don't have to. But close your eyes for the sake of this exercise. And I want you to take a deep breath in. Take a deep breath out. I want you to imagine yourself in nature. I want you to imagine yourself surrounded by trees and tall grass. I want you to, in the distance, you can hear the sounds of a babbling brook or a river going by. You can hear animals, birds chirping in the trees, maybe some larger animals off in the distance breaking twigs as they go through the forests. And you know that this place is home. This is where you belong. Everything around you gives you everything you need. The trees provide you with shelter. The plants provide you with sustenance. The animals provide you with the clothing you need and the food for your stomachs. The plants provide you with medicines. The river, you can go down to the river and you can drink right out of it. This is your home. This was the life of my grandparents and my parents. This is not what exists anymore. So imagine this place. You are there. Now imagine you start to hear something off in the distance. It's loud and it's foreign. You've never heard it before. Soon you start to smell things that don't smell like they belong there anymore. And soon you start to see smoke billowing in the air. This is the reality that the people of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation have faced. I'd like you to open your eyes now. Now this is a place, this is a reality. This isn't some like Avatar movie. This is the actual reality that my parents lived in. My, my father was a hunter and trapper with his father and they lived off of the land in northern Alberta, northern Saskatchewan. The people of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation are Dene Sut Lene people. And they are people that um, exist on this planet, or on this plane, as people connected to that land. Our territory expands uh, within the lower Athabasca and northwestern Saskatchewan planning regions, and we hold lands that extend into a little bit of the Northwest Territories, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and a tip of British Columbia is the traditional Treaty 8 area. So since time immemorial and long before our people signed treaty and treaty number eight, our people lived in this region and we sustained ourselves off of everything that it provided us. Our, our families and our communities relied on Mother Earth and all that she provided for us. So as Dene Sutlene people, we have an intricate relationship with Mother Earth and customary practices that allow us to live in harmony with her as she keeps our physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being in balance. However, what has happened is there's been a massive industrialization of ACFN's traditional ter territory that has led to the cumulative removal of our lands, wildlife, and fish habitats, as well as destruction to the ecological, aesthetic, and sensory systems that our people have relied on for years. Consequently, consequently this is in fact a breach of treaty. So what exactly does that mean? So our people signed Treaty 8 in about 1899, well, in 1899, on the shores of Lake Athabasca. This treaty was a sharing agreement that we made with the crowns. And this agreement was to guarantee our hunting, fishing, and trapping rights for our people to support and just to sustain our traditional livelihoods. Now, we, as a part of that agreement, the crown uh, took treaties and they ingrained them into the Canadian Constitution in 1985. So under Section 35, we actually have rights that are supposed to be protected. However, what has happened is the industrialization of treaty lands has led to the cumulative removal of our ability to access our traditional foods. So what are traditional foods of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation? Large game. So some of the large game that we rely on are buffalo, um, moose, and caribou. Those are the three major large game that we hunt in the region. And what has happened is that we're seeing that uh, much of the land is being destroyed through open pit mining processes, where they literally 
rip up like tons and tons of earth. One operator alone in the Athabasca tar sands that is um, operating open pit mines has removed 1.4 million tons of earth for one operation alone. So it's the complete annihilation of uh, pristine ecosystems that are necessary for the survival of species within the Athabasca region. In addition to open pit mines, the government has sanctioned what are called in situ mines. In situ mines are less visceral. They're not, you know, big shovels ripping apart the earth, but they are sort of structures that look like they're just kind of like little mini refineries. And what these mini refineries are is they're actually taking natural gas and water, which is taken from the Athabasca River system, and they're superheating it and pumping it into the ground to melt what is called bitumen or tar sands, where they then suck it back out and they have built a series of pipelines throughout northern Alberta, which are fragmenting the ecosystems for many of the large game and other wildlife in the region, um, and are creating, is creating massive amounts of greenhouse gas emissions. The government has deemed in situ well pads as environmentally benign even though they are, in fact, uh, fragmenting the ecosystems. Both projects, either open pit mines or in situ, require massive amounts of water withdrawals from the Athabasca River system. This, uh, in turn, is making the river system, which is a roadway and a lifeline to the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation, less navigable and harder to access. And a part of that also what's happening with the tar sands development is that we're also creating massive amounts of toxic tailings or toxic waste byproduct either through in situ or through open pit mines. These toxic tailings now cover an area of about 180 square kilometers in Alberta. Some of these toxic lakes, which they try to call ponds, you can actually see them from outer space. There are a few of these toxic tailings that actually sit within about 100 yards from the shores of Lake Ath or the Athabasca River system. This is the river system that feeds into the community of Fort Chippewan where the members of ACFN live. And the community of Fort Chippewan is a flying community or a navigable river community, meaning they use the river to get in and out of the community or plane when the river is not navigable. In addition to that, the community of Fort Chippewan relies on these intact rivers and waterways for food sources such as fish, so much of the fish uh, have been contaminated, or their habitats, critical habitats for where they breed and spawn are being disrupted or contaminated by toxic runoff, either through tailings or directly from in situ well pads and so on and so forth. Now, what's happening with that is the government has stated that, well, the toxic contamination or the toxic contaminants now found in the Athabasca River and in Lake Athabasca are natural. They say that the Athabasca River system uh, sits on the shores of what is raw bitumen that seeps into the river systems and therefore the contamination that's now being seen would happen even if they were developing or not. This is when they're saying this as we see, you can see visual pictures of tailings sitting next to the river system. You can see projects that are literally only about 150 uh, meters from the shores of the river system, and yet they still decry that it is nothing but natural contamination. People are now finding fish with lesions, de de uh, curved spines, deformities, and they taste funny, they're filled with tumors. This is the same thing for some of the large game that the people rely on. Now these foods are traditional foods, and I don't want traditional to seem like something from a long time ago. I eat them, my children eat them, my aunts, my cousins, and my nieces and my nephews. We all eat this food today. I have a moose in my fridge right now, or in my freezer. I have fish from Lake Athabasca in my freezer. I have medicines picked along the Athabasca River and Lake Athabasca on my, in my cupboards. These are things that our people still use to this day. People eat tr other traditional foods such as waterfowl, ducks, geese, and these are also subject to the contamination of the Athabasca River. Who heard about the 1,606 ducks that landed in the tailings ponds? Now, we think poor ducks, but a lot of my family said, what happened to those 1,600 ducks that we were going to be hunting this season? 
What does that mean for the other ducks that manage to fly out of the ponds? Are they contaminated? Am I going to be eating contaminated food? So there's now this growing fear of eating contaminated food in our region. Um, many people are starting to stray away from traditional and cultural foods because they're afraid for their lives. And that is not uh, an ill-founded fear. There has actually been reported from the Alberta Cancer Board that there is, in fact, elevated rates of cancer in the community of Fort Chippewan. However, once again, the government says there's no way to directly tie it to contamination in the river system because, get this, First Nations people are also subject to high-risk lifestyles. So what we're seeing is that there's a complete disregard, one, for our treaty and traditional rights, which are ingrained in our Canadian Constitution, to ensure that we are allowed to continue practicing unabated our hunting, fishing, and trapping rights. Secondarily, our human rights to access uh, clean environments and food sources is being violated. Our people are in the direct path of severe contamination from industrial development downstream. <clears throat> so some of the things that I, I'd want to stress is there's not a lot of data being done on traditional food sources of Aboriginal people. But just to give you an idea, caribou. Caribou are on the Species at Risk um, Act, and they're classified under the Species at Risk Act, so there is available data. In Alberta, caribou populations have declined by almost two-thirds since the 60s, and that Alberta's, all of Alberta's caribou herds are in danger of extinction. And that is largely due to industrial disturbances. Alberta has the highest level of industrial distur disturbances on caribou, and it's in part to tar sands development. And the government can't, can no longer deny that this is true. Uh, in May of 2011, a secret government document was exposed by a reporter where it, it said in this, there were slides that said, oil sands development will continue to put pressure on vulnerable species, example, woodland caribou. Yeah. Removal of landscape features for mining's reduce available habitat. And habitat alterations, pipelines, survey cut lines, and even reclaimed lands that the government says, don't worry everyone, we're going to put everything back to the way that it should be uh, through our reclamation process. So let's not get all worked up, we're reclaiming the lands. In this report, it said even reclaimed lands can make habitat less suitable for native forest species. So even if they were to put things back in a reclaimed state, there's no guarantee that any of these species would return to their numbers or um, at the level that we saw them before. And beyond habitat issues, oil sands pollutants in the ecosystem could also harm the wildlife. This is the admissions of the Canadian and Alberta government, and yet we're seeing that application after application in the Alberta tar sands is being approved without adequate um, studies baseline studies on water levels, uh, water contamination, or its impact on treaty and Aboriginal rights. Some of the impacts are obviously elevated rates of cancer, but it's also led to major changes in the diet that's led to increases in diabetes and obesity in the community, in small rural communities such as Fort Chippewan. And one of the biggest things that we don't really talk about is when we're talking about cultural loss and a loss of being able to practice our hunting, fishing, and gathering rights and our traditional diets is it leads to an increase of drug and alcohol abuse and other psychological disorders, which comes from this inability to access our lands, go out on the lands, continue that interconnected connection that we have with Mother Earth and with our food sources. So ACFN is working towards fighting for better protection of our lands and the species and our treaty rights. Currently, Shell Canada is up for approval for an application to expand one of their existing projects, and that would increase production by 100,000 barrels per day and re would require the mining out of 23 kilometers of the Muskeg River. Critical fish fishing grounds, critical habitat for caribou and woodland buff buffalo, and it would also require the contamination of the McClellan wetland complex where many of the ducks and waterfowl that we hunt uh, live. And in addition, they are also proposing another production which would increase their production by 200,000 barrels. So ACFN is now on the defense. 
We are challenging their permits based on a breach of constitutional uh, rights under Section 35 to hunting, fishing, and trapping, and we're currently in litigation to stop them from moving forward this project until such a time that they can address and ensure that our rights to access our traditional foods and food sources and lands is, is protected now and into the future. Thank you. Thank you.